Welcome to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. It is Tuesday, February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day, Committee. Uh, I would like to welcome Representative Burroughs, who is here to give us a quick intro to her Bill H-180 Act relating to standardizing the opening time of polling places. So, Representative Burroughs, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me in. Uh, for the record, I am Elizabeth Burroughs. I represent Windsor One, which is the uh, towns of uh, Heartland, West Windsor, and Windsor, and I represent, or I reside in West Windsor. And uh, I think that introduction is probably longer than the bill, <laughs> <laughs> which simply says uh, the, this bill proposes to standardize the opening time for all polling places <clears throat> in the state of Vermont. All polling places in the state already have a standardized closing time of 7 p.m. And uh, uh, if you look at the um, signers of the bill that, um, yeah, the bill as currently drafted, um, it, it's uh, the people who supported it are totally tripartisan. Um, it's, a, it's a love it or hate it bill. And uh, I'm not asking, I'm asking you to set the time if you should take this up. I don't care what the time is. Um, although uh, part of the reason for the bill is that uh, there are several, if not many towns that open uh, well into the morning, which is uh, 10, 1030, um, which is really not equitable for people to be able to vote, especially when the, close, the polls close at seven. <laughs> That's it. That's really it. Are there any questions? You did, you did say this was one. Uh, they're all at 7 p.m. though. Everybody is 7 Everybody p.m. closes at 7 p.m. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think the, the window of opening right now ranges from somewhere, I think 5 a.m. is the earliest. I know, I think oh. Huntington actually opens oh, at 5 a.m. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah, the town, and that's the, wow. yeah, that's town, I think Huntington opens at 5 a.m. That's the earliest. It's 3.30 wake up. Yeah. I thought so, it was 7 a.m. 7 a.m. is uh, mo most of the larger towns. I think that's probably the median. Most, most towns. Uh, I have I have three towns in my district, and each opens at a different time. And uh, the not that you need a bill to um, <coughs> correct the the mishandling of the times by the Secretary of State's office, but they're often misprinted and different different um, types of information getting out to the public and causing confusion. Um, so that's another aspect of it. Representative News? Um, I was just curious, um, yeah, how, if you'd heard from folks in towns that have different or, you know, kind of unique opening times, if that, that would be helpful for them. <laughs> we, we had this conversation. We thought, oh, we're the only town that, but uh, I, one of my towns, the town I live in, doesn't open till 10, and everyone around us is either 7 or 8 a.m. It's two hours less voting. Yeah. We had, our town had uh, the Secretary of State's office put out a uh, notice that our town vote, our polls opened like two hours before they actually did. And so people, but people did persevere and come a second and third time three times in several cases to, to actually be able to vote. So uh, <laughs> but it's a simple bill and it's you know not meant to stand on its own. Um, well, as you know, uh, we are going to be hearing testimony on, uh, there's a miscellaneous bill we have on the table that we're gonna start taking some testimony on in earnest today. And so I appreciate you coming in and sharing this additional idea for consideration. I talked to several of the clerks who are visiting for Vermont Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association. Uh, they were in the card room today and there's a variety of opinions amongst them. So it'll be I'm sure. get their feedback if the committee feels like we should take further discussion on that. Uh, I, I will say that I heard from one uh, poll operator who was upset at the idea of being forced to open her polls later than she already does. So it goes both ways. 
Interesting. Uh, I feel like the simple idea may have uh, um, sparked a lot of conversation representing growth. So thanks for, thanks for bringing this. We're not afraid of tackling the tough issues here in house government. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. Do really. you need anything else from me? Cheers. Anybody else have any other questions for Representative Burroughs? <laughs> You can take a chocolate kiss on your way out. If you Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so I have invited um, representatives from the major parties and some other um, government groups in over the next couple of days. So. Um, we first on our list here have uh, Mr. Paul Dame, who's the chair of the Vermont Republican Party. So uh, if you'd like to come and take the witness seat, I'd really appreciate you spending some time with us today. I've asked the um, folks to give their thoughts in response to the draft miscellaneous elections bill, the 230 uh, miscellaneous changes to election laws. And I appreciate you being with us today. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, it's kind of fun that some of you know, like including uh, Representative Mulricky. I used to be a rep, so it's interesting to be on this side of the table uh, for once. But uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to weigh in on, on this. <clears throat> uh, again, my name is Paul Dame. I am the uh, state chair of the uh, Vermont Republican Party. And um, uh, just, you know, there's a lot in here, uh, which, which I think, uh, you know, is kind of interesting. So I just want to go through some of the main points um, you know, the, the first first off sort of the sore loser law, um, I think, is is something that, you know, we don't really have a, a problem with. Uh, I, I do. What I do notice here is is um, or a, a way you can sort of enhance this is I think people need to decide up front if they're going to be an independent, if they're going to be a Republican and a progressive, they should pick a lane at the beginning of the process and commit to that lane, at least through that election, right? Next election, they can make a different choice. Um, and so I think even if people win a particular primary or uh, they still shouldn't have the op to, uh, option to go into another primary or to run as an independent. So I think what's, what I saw missing there was even if you win a party primary as almost ha or would have happened if the election laws uh, were different. We, we had somebody running one of our primaries whose intention was to take that that place and eliminate it on the general election ballot and then run as, a, run as an independent. So I think that in, uh, you could add to the sore loser law a prohibition on even if you win the primary, you still shouldn't get to run as an independent. I think that makes it clear that people are either an independent or they're running in a uh, in, in a primary to represent a party. Um, I think it's a good move to uh, line up the filing deadlines. Uh, it, it was always kind of uh, peculiar to me why uh, independence got to file later. Uh, then everybody knows sort of at the beginning of the process in May uh, that these are the candidates that are going to be on the general election ballot um, or, uh, or you know, in, the, in the case of primaries, we're eliminating people who, who don't make it through the primary. Uh, one of the concerns I had was on sort of the organizational reporting. Um, you know, obviously a lot of uh, the, the people who are uh, serve as town chairs, as county chairs, uh, they're doing so in a volunteer capacity. Um, and so I'm a little concerned about putting name, address, phone number information into a uh, into Secretary of State's office uh, that then becomes publicly searchable without knowing a lot about who's requesting that information, where is it going, who are, uh, does everybody in those town and county organizations know that their information is going to be subject to a public records request? Um, uh, especially when you consider there are other organizations that are involved in political activity uh, that are not parties, you know, uh, PACs and other things, who have similar people in volunteer capacities and none of their personal information is getting collected by the, uh, the Secretary of State. So obviously, the Republican Party is uh, concerned about you know, privacy, and I think this is a place where uh, I don't understand what the public benefit is for names, address, contact info for volunteers on those town, uh, on those town committees. Um, on the matter of uh, dual nominations, uh, again, I, I, I think 
what my my preference is, my goal is making sure we give voters as much information on the ballot as, as we can. And so when when a candidate decides to run sort of as a, a fusion candidate or get this dual nomination, they're communicating to the voter uh, or they're communicating to voters in those particular primaries that I have some level of support uh, amongst both of those primaries. I think that Vermonters like people who uh, like candidates who can uh, cross the line, work across the line. And if we want to encourage that or at least communicate to voters that we have a candidate who has done that or is trying making an effort to do that. Uh, I think that's a good thing. And I think it reduces some of the, um, you know, some of the, the, uh, the partisan uh, nature of, of uh, some of the elections uh, by allowing candidates who are, who are doing that to, uh, to, to keep those dual nominations. Um, uh, for candidate demographic info, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't, you know, we don't have a, a problem with that, especially I think the fact that it's listed as being uh, optional, you know, is, is appropriate. Um, and then another place where, you know, I think I have a little more concern is on the certification for write-ins, uh, especially because the, the deadline is so early. A lot of times people don't realize that there isn't somebody, especially for some of these smaller offices, uh, that there's nobody on the ballot until they get their uh, absentee ballot now. And sometimes we've had folks in races where we weren't able to recruit somebody before the deadline decide that, hey, you know, if nobody else is going to run, um, I'll throw my name in. And so whenever we put a, a hurdle in front of any voter who wants to participate in the process, especially if they're sort of not part of the regular and traditional um, uh, you know, party apparatus. I, I think it's a, a good thing. It's a welcoming thing to allow people to enter into the process, especially as a candidate, and keep that bar as low as possible. Uh, so I think allowing the writing candidate to, to get on uh, and to be counted and, and be uh, accepted as a potential winner if they meet the requirements is important. But I also think it's important to count those actual votes. Right. I think that when people want to vote, when people make a write in vote, it's one of the most intentional votes that you can possibly make. Right. Some of the uh, the least intentional are, are in other states. They have straight uh, straight party ticket voting, uh, which you may not even know the names of the people that you voted for. But when a voter decides I'm going to write somebody's name in, you, you got to know that person's name and you got to have a really good reason to do something that's sort of out of out of the normal. So I can't think of an, a vote that's more intentional than a write-in vote. And what I see in this bill that's concerning is that we're going to count that vote as less. Right? The, that name isn't going to show up in the um, in the official totals there if that person, uh, if it wasn't an official write-in candidate. Uh, so that individual who cast that vote isn't going to really feel like their vote got recorded. And I think in a in a time where uh, you know folks are uh, there's there's greater attention on the election process. Uh, having individual write in votes show up. I understand it's a little it's extra work for the town clerks, but I think it gives our voters, um, you know, the confidence that their vote really does count no matter uh, how sort of outside the mainstream uh, it is. So I think that, uh, you know, we would be for leaving the, the write in process the way that it is. I think the 25 minimum, you know, for for house races and and at various different offices is appropriate, right? You've got to have a threshold uh, to actually get elected. But I think it's important to voters, let them know your vote counts and we're going to count even uh, even the write ins there. Um, so I think those were the main uh, parts of the bill that I saw, I think. Uh, while I'm here, you know, I wanted to mention a couple things that I think you know, we're missing. Uh, you know, we've had a little bit of discussion uh, in our party about uh, the primary, especially this last year. And one of the things that that seems to be missing is really a party is, is a brand. And uh, we've over time, right, it used to be that the parties would get together in a smoke filled room and they would pick people. And if you didn't know the right person, you didn't get on the ballot. And we've moved farther away from that to creating probably one of the most open processes that we have because we don't have uh, party registration in Vermont. Uh, anybody can run on any ballot. And so if I wanted to, I could run for governor as a Democrat, even though I'm the chair of the Republican Party. 
And I think there's a case where we've gotten so open that we may need to come back towards the middle and give parties some kind of a mechanism uh, either to uh, restrict people from getting on the ballot or at least denoting, hey, this is somebody who the, the people in the party have talked to, uh, is a legitimate and valid candidate. Uh, one suggestion is in the state of Connecticut, they allow parties uh, to endorse candidates. While I'm not a big fan of the idea of having a single candidate be endorsed, I think maybe a modification of that would be where you allow the party to maybe have approved candidates. So if you have maybe four candidates and there's somebody who, for whatever reasons, don't meet the criteria of the party, you know, we have rules against, um, uh, you know, that we wouldn't support felons, we wouldn't support other people who've run in primaries and gotten less than a certain percentage before, the people we just think aren't viable or aren't representing, you know, our party. Uh, then we could say, all right, these three people are, uh, candidates that the, the state party uh, is amenable to working with. And here's somebody who really doesn't belong on our ballot, but because we've got an open process, you know, we're not preventing anyone from running. But it sends that signal, again, getting more information to the voter that this person is going to be working with the party. This person is not <clears throat> working with the party. I think one of the things I had heard sort of anecdotally people voting in uh, in other primaries. Uh, you know, the only information you really get on the primary is the name of the town that the person's from. And so sometimes that's the only information on the ballot and people will make decisions, uh, sometimes even on statewide races, uh, because they haven't heard, maybe they don't watch TV or maybe they don't, you know, they don't get email, whatever else. They just say, oh, well, this person's from such and such. Um, that, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, a more Republican town, a more Democratic, a more progressive town and can make uh, inferments there. And I think what would be more helpful information for voters is to say, hey, uh, in the cases where a party would want to, they can say, here are two of those three candidates that we would, uh, that we endorse or that we would work with. Here's somebody who got on the ballot, but is not gonna cooperate you know, with the party. And, and allowing also the parties to decide not to do that. I think most of the time, the parties would rather keep their hands clean and not put their thumb on the scale. But in those rare cases where there's kind of a reason uh, you know, to break the rule, it would give the parties some control over, uh, over the brand and over the, uh, um, the party that, they're, uh, th that they're, they're communicating to, to voters. Um, two other things I think that would be helpful, you know, that maybe aren't quite on the same scope of the, the bill, but are still general election related, um, is uh, is looking at cleaning up our voter rolls. I think a lot of times we've we've realized with COVID and sort of the universal mail out ballot, how many people are on our voter rolls that don't belong there. I I purchased a house four years ago and I got a ballot this year from somebody who hasn't lived there since then and they weren't the person I bought my house from. Um, and uh, I was talking to some of the clerks uh, before, and it sounds like there could be up to an eight-year process from the time that we suspect somebody is not, um, is not a valid voter anymore until we can actually get them removed. Uh, this used to be a problem because we didn't allow people uh, you know, to register after, uh, where was it, the week before the election. But now that we have same-day voter registration, if we ever remove somebody inappropriately, we took somebody off the list before we should have, maybe they just didn't vote for two years for whatever reason, everyone can get back on the list and cast their ballot on election day. So to me, we had this hedge about why we didn't take people off the voter rolls too easy. And I think we've solved that problem with same day voter registration. So I think giving town clerks and boards of civil authority who can be a check on that town clerk the, the ability to remove people um, who everybody in town knows that they left uh, or whatever the case may be. Because when we reduce those voter rolls, first of all, we're spending less money uh, mailing out ballots that don't belong places. It's even people who get those ballots um, and have no ill intention, it doesn't create confidence when you get a ballot mailed to your house that doesn't belong there. Um, and so while there's no reports of anybody doing something like that, there is a, there is a confidence issue there. And when we reduce the voter rolls to make them more accurate, it actually uh, shows that Vermont has a higher voter participation, right? If you think about voter participation being a fraction, if our, if our denominator is too big with people who have moved out of state, uh, if we, if we right-size that number, 
uh, you know, Vermont can report accurately our voter participation score. So we think making it easier for town clerks going through uh, the BCA, um, shortening that time frame that they can uh, remove uh, voter rolls. Um, and then obviously, you know, uh, the something that the Republican Party has always been looking for is implementing voter ID. And I think especially uh, for same day registration. I mean, one of the issues I had is when I moved, I was on, uh, if I had gone to the town clerk in Essex, everybody had known me there. I had won elections there before. Uh, my name was on uh, the voter roll there. I would have voted no problem. Um, but two weeks before I had just moved into my new house. And when I went uh, to vote where I was supposed to vote in my new house, I walked in and was able to cast a vote that day. Uh, so I think there's still uh, an area there where we, there's, there's potential uh, for people on same day voter registration uh, um, to vote in more, one, in more than one location. And we're not even requiring voter ID there. Vermont's the only state that does same day voter registration with no voter ID. So I think at least on same day registration in introducing voter ID is a good safety mechanism to make sure that, um, uh, that, that, uh, that we're getting the right people voting in the right place. So that's really all I had for any prepared testimony. So I'm happy to take any questions or. Thanks, I think you, you covered uh, most of the, the big points and I appreciate some of the feedback. Um, are there folks on the committee have questions for Mr. Dane? Representative Byron? How are you? Uh, no, thanks for coming in and offering the perspective. So uh, what I wanted to circle back to was the point you raised or proposed um, about primary candidates within the party and getting sort of a, I, I guess, sort of a, a mark of approval mm -hmm. from the party apparatus, whatever that may be. Um, so that would be something that would be visibly known on the primary ballot. So let's say just sort of, so I, I see this correctly in my head, right? Five candidates, two of them, a party does not find favorable for them to do, the three would have that mark of sorts. Yep. Okay. Um, and I don't know, it just at first, my first instinct sees like there could be ways that could get a little murky, right? It's like, how do people go about that? Do maybe, you know, candidates' willingness to donate to a party apparatus maybe come into play. You know what I mean? Yep. Like I, I just, it made, me, it made my stomach do a couple of funny things when I started thinking about it. Yeah. But just for clarification, that's what you're sort of. Well, I think giving uh, parties the, the option. Monetary, yeah. Right, giving parties the option uh, to do that would allow them to uh, to really con control their their brand and allow, right? Because uh, what happens, uh, especially with, um, you know, in certain cases, uh, anybody can get on any party's ballot. There, there's there's really no prohibition, uh, uh, and Brooke Page has run as a Democrat for governor uh, before. So so this would be one way that the party could communicate to voters: this person isn't really uh, playing, um, you know, within the intent of of the party apparatus. Uh, because our party, our, our primary system is so open, I think it's just a little bit too open and we've got to do something to fence that in. Uh, it, I would see it as something that parties would probably rarely use, uh, that there would, no, there would not be any requirement for the party to uh, endorse or approve any candidates, but that they would be able to do that through the same mechanisms that they can fill a vacancy, um, you know, if somebody were to pass away or something like that. Okay. Yep. I mean, I, I understand how you're framing this, but thank you. Okay. Representative Morawicki. So with party registration, all that? Um, I, I think it could. I'm not an advocate for party registration. I think Vermonters are independent and they, they like being independent. Um, you know, that, that party registration, uh, you know, there's games you can play with that too. What would happen is people in certain districts find that one party tends to do well, so they register in that party's primary. You know, we see that a lot both in Massachusetts and in places like Texas where the one party is more dominant. Um, but I'm not advocating for party registration. Senator Burke. Your uh Denial at the poll same day registration scenario. <clears throat> and that, uh, this is ignorance on my part. 
Can that only be done at the poll or at the town clerk's office? Or my question basically is, does the JP have the authority to go and register somebody that can't come to the poll and just found out they were not on the rolls anymore? Um, so, so you're saying is somebody who found out on election day that they're not on the rolls and is unable to go to handicap. Um, uh, that might be a, a better question for the town clerks. I'm not, I'm not aware of that scenario. I think that most of the same day registration is done at the, at the polling place. I don't know if there's been a case of somebody registering, you know, like, uh, you know, when you, when you send, send JPs, um, I don't know that there's any prohibition on that, but I'm not, I'm not the authority on that. We could ask director sending about that when he next is up to testify. <laughs> All right. He's in the room. So that's the look. John. Representative Nugent. Um, I just wanted to clarify that in terms of the verifying identity at the polls, um, having been a JP for a while, what we would do, um, is that someone could register on the same day and then they would fill out the voter information form, which does require you to give like a license number. Um, and then after the, um, after the election, the clerk would go in and um, verify that. And if it turned out it wasn't accurate, they would you know, do something about it after that. But it's not like there's no verification. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's, that's an interesting, because uh, in that scenario, the vote has already been placed into the ballot box. Um, so there wouldn't be much the, that the JP could do about it. It's one of the reasons that uh, when I was when I was here before saying same day voter registration should be done on a provisional ballot. So if we did find that there was something inaccurate about a same day registration, if it was set aside in those provisional ballots, then before uh, you give the, the JPs or the uh, election officials a day or two to verify the records. And if everything's good, it gets included in with the rest of the votes. And if not, then you've already identified that vote and separated it ahead of time. The thing I wanted to ask about is, I heard you say pretty clearly uh, in your testimony in response to the um, sore loser proposal that's in the draft language about kind of the strong feeling that to have integrity, you gotta stay in your lane. You pick, pick whether you're gonna be an I or a D or an R or a P at the beginning and follow that all the way through. And at I least for that election. Next election, <laughs> you can change your mind. I wanted to contrast that a little bit against your testimony around the sort of dual nominations, because um, I've wrestled with this a lot in deciding what to present to the committee to solve, especially the issue, which we'll hear more about tomorrow around a relatively small number of write-ins if there's an open party candidate in like a county election, for instance, mm -hmm. you can grab that nod and there's no way for the local party to say that candidate they got some of their friends to grab our ballot, but they're not with us. Like they, we don't want our brand to use your, your language. Yeah. So, so how would you feel about some, some mechanism, perhaps other than endorsement, like raising the threshold of the percentage of write-in votes that you need to get, or to have some check-in from parties where, where they they'd have some say if the person hadn't filed and they want and they won that right and not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's that was sort of another angle that I had had toyed with, sort of as a contrast to the kind of approval process, is allowing uh, you know giving parties some kind of discretion to either uh, you know remove names or require something from the can some kind of engagement with the party and the candidate. Um, to uh, uh, to getting their their name on there, you know. The, the reason I didn't sort of lead with that is I feel like there's a lot more unintended problems with that, um, and we we maybe move back too far towards that sort of smoke filled room, uh, lack of transparency there, where you know a party can tell somebody you can't run uh, or we're not going to endorse you uh, or we're not, we're not going to let you have the the party the party label. Um, but I, but I think if you gave, gave parties some kind of mechanism to, um, yeah, I, I guess as I had always thought of it, it would be at the beginning of the primary process, uh, allowing the parties to say this person, right. We could do an inverse of that saying this person doesn't meet party standards, uh, for, for something. Uh, I don't know if it quite addresses the fact that after they've won the primary, because they got enough write-in votes, 
Um, that to me seems to be a little stickier situation because they've already won the election. Um, uh, and how do you how do you eliminate sort of nefarious actors and still encourage genuine kind of grassroots uh, engagement? Uh, it's one of those things where you're, you're going to you're going to make an error somewhere. And if you're going to make that error, I would rather make the error that includes greater participation uh, from from people who maybe haven't understood the process uh, b before. Um, but I, I think, you know, creating some kind of mechanism where the party gets a, a check after the um, after the primary. I don't know what that would look like, but I, I, that's something I could see myself supporting with some details. Well, I'd love to encourage the committee to think about this particular issue has been on my mind since last August. And we're going to hear some testimony tomorrow morning about this very thing. So that threshold issue of if you're already on one party's line, what, what should it really take to get the other major party nominations? I think is, is a key fundamental question that I wanted this committee to look at and putting this bill. On. So I really, really appreciate you being here. Chair Dam, I know, you know, we're from opposite parties and you've really done a thoughtful job of responding to some of the things we put on the table and I uh, really welcome that feedback. Thank you for being here today. Well, glad, glad to do it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so next up, uh, I believe uh, Mr. Rotsky is here, the Executive Director of the Vermont Progressive Party. Josh, welcome to House Go Box. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today. Yes, thank you for inviting me. So my name is Josh Ronsky. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Progressive Party. I've been in this position since 2016. So I've been through a few election cycles at this point. Um, yeah, so I'll just get right into it. Um, you know, we don't have a decent number of the proposal. We don't have strong feelings about. Um, so I really want to focus on um, a, few, a few key areas, one of which um, being the elimination of candidates to run um, as fusion fusion candidates, either D slash R, R, D, P, D, P, D, R, whatever. We've had all combinations of fusion candidates in Vermont. Um, so just, you know, a few quick facts on um, fusion voting and how it kind of operates um, in reality, um, at least in the past election. Um, so in the past, in 2022, there were a total of 69 fusion candidates um, that ran in Vermont, and eight of them were P slash D, 10 were D slash P, 16 were D slash R, and 30 were R slash D, and then another five were R um, and Libertarian. Um, so 69, um, majority of those are not um, progressive party candidates. Um, I'm just kind of saying that to you know, show this is something used by all political parties. <laughs> um, so fusion is really popular among Vermonters. Um, of the 69 candidates who ran using fusion, I believe 60 of them actually won, including seven P slash Ds, eight D slash Ps, 16 D slash Rs, and 29 R slash Ds. Um, a large number of those are in the county level. Um, so 32 were county, there were two statewide. 18 um, fusion candidates, one in the Vermont House, and eight um, fusion candidates, I believe, in the Vermont Senate. Um, so this is something that, you know, it's being used on every single level of government, um, you know, from the county to state and statewide office um, by all different political parties. And it's been, you know, fairly popular. Vermonters like it. And I think a major reason why Vermonters like fusion voting is because they appreciate when the parties can actually work together and collaborate on a candidate. I think we see so much um, vitriol at the national level and even in Vermont that when um, the political parties get behind the same candidate in certain races, um, you know, Vermonters do appreciate that. And I think that's, that's not a bad thing. Um, we're not the only state that uses fusion voting. There are eight states in total. Um, the biggest one, one of the biggest being New York State, um, which has a long history of um, fusion voting, they do it a little bit different than us, um, rather than um, having a R slash D or P slash D on the ballot, they have different ballot lines. Um, so there are different ways, you know, we, if, if there was interest in reforming how fusion voting operates, there are different ways that, you know, we could, um, we could do that. 
But in general, yeah, we are very opposed to the idea of eliminating a candidate's ability to run with two different party labels. Um, Vermont, yeah, has a long tradition of allowing open affiliation with whatever political party you choose. And it really feels like, um, you know, I, I heard uh, my colleague on the Republican Party talk about how um, it's good for voters to have more information and fusion voting is a re really good way to do that. Um, what better way for a voter to understand where someone's values lie than by actually having those multiple party labels on the ballot. Like if you're running as a P slash D, that's a very clear understanding that, you know, you have the support of both progressives and Democrats and you lean more towards the progressive side of the spectrum um, ideologically. If you're running as an R slash D or a D slash R, um, it's good for voters to know that both Republicans and Democrats are um, supporting your candidacy and you're running more to the center potentially. Um, and maybe you're a bridge builder between um, those two parties. Um, so, you know, it's, it really doesn't feel like something that, um, that there's a problem that we should be looking to address. It feels like this is something that has worked very well in Vermont and it should be continued. Um, so moving on to some of the other, the idea that we're going to um, eliminate, um, you know, as it's often referred to, the second bite at the apple or the sore loser um, provision. We also disagree with that. Um, yeah, I, I would wonder how many times that has actually happened in recent memory in Vermont. I don't think it's a very common instance. And generally, the Progressive Party, we discourage folks. Yeah. 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 Or, yeah. I'll just say it happened to you. Yes. Or against oh. me. Okay. Um, yeah, so it doesn't happen very frequently, um, although it does happen. Generally, at least speaking for the Progressive Party, we dis discourage um, folks within our party from doing that because generally if you do lose a Democratic or Progressive primary, um, you're not likely to then go on and win the general. At the same time, I would um, point out the fact that Vermont has a huge issue with um, uncontested races, right? So I believe about a third of all races in Vermont in the past election were uncontested. Um, and that's that's a huge problem, right? And um, th this has a potential to actually make that worse, right? So if we're saying that you can't run um, in the general election if you lost the nomination of one political party, um, that's eliminating more people from being able to run on the general election ballot. and. You know, with so so many uncontested races, I think really we should be looking at ways to expand the ability of um, people to get on the ballot and make that easier, um, and not not make it more challenging for people to get on the ballot. Um, the same thing is true with the um, restrictions to the write-in campaigns. Um, it just feels like it's a further it's a weakening of the democratic process and further cutting down the ability of writing candidates to actually. Um, get on the ballot. And as my Republican co colleague said, we have a long, proud tradition of counting every vote in Vermont. And I think that that's, that's a really a good thing. If someone is going out and putting their name down, putting a name of a candidate down as a writing candidate, um, that vote should be counted. And we should have a good sense of um, you know, how many write-in votes and who those write-in votes are for. Um, because even if they're really unlikely to get elected, and I do understand it is a lot of extra work for the town clerks, and I appreciate that, um, it is important for voters to see like where those write-in votes are going. Um, and yeah, just the last piece I would comment on, um, the idea that we're going to eliminate the campaign contribution limits for um, candidates between, between candidates and political parties, I don't think that's a good thing that we should be supporting. Um, Vermonters in general, I believe, want us to get more money out of politics. And um, there are already ways for candidates to, you know, if you're done running for office and you want to donate the money, you can already donate that money to charity or other, other, other ways. And we shouldn't be creating more avenues to funnel money into the political system and avoid campaign contribution limits. Um, we should be looking at ways to um, lessen the amount of money in our political system. Um, so yeah, those, those are some of the key points on the actual bill. And I, I would say, um, you know, there are a lot of issues with our current system that, and there are reforms that we would support and we think that are really valuable um, for this committee and others to look into. Those include systems such as ranked choice voting, which um, would expand, you know, demo our, our democratic and enhance our democratic system. Um, we could look at um, what other states have done 
um, in terms of creating a unified primary system. Um, that's, that's an interesting model that's worth exploring. Um, and we should also be looking at public financing of elections. Um, so those are all the types of reforms that we support, um, or at least support exploring. Um, but yeah, eliminating fusion voting and eliminating second bite of the apple, um, we, we do not support at all. And um, that's all I have for my testimony. Happy to answer questions. <clears throat> What's happening? Senator Cooper. Josh, thanks for coming. Uh, could you give us a rundown on the unified primary system? And what that looks like? Yeah, so the unified primary system, um, and this is not, we haven't, this isn't like a statement of support, it's just something I think is worth looking at. Um, so basically you have a single primary and every political party candidate runs. So there could be like three Democrats, three Republicans, three progressives um, for one seat all on that same primary election ballot. And, no and then the top two. Independents in that case. Um, I believe that would, I th it probably depends on how it's actually structured, how the law is structured. Um, yeah, so that's that's a good question. I'm unsure, and it would probably depend on like how how the law would be written here, um, whether you want to include independence or not. Um, but the idea is then you're you're narrowing it down to two candidates um, from the from from that primary ballot. So you could end up with you know in, in a very conservative district, you could end up with two Republicans in the general election, or you could end up with a Democrat and a Republican, or a Republican and a progressive. Um, so it's a way to kind of um, yeah, have everyone on the same ballot initially, and then it moves on to a second round, essentially. Representative Byron. <clears throat> so in the last election cycle's primary 2022, how many scandal loan ballots were cast for progressive candidates? Um, are you talking about in the primary? Yes. Um, I'm actually not sure. I don't have those numbers on me right now. I'm sorry about that. No, 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 no. Yeah, it's easily accessible on the yeah Secretary of State. Yeah, because yeah, we did see them. I don't remember exactly what it was. Yeah. But I, I remember being a little surprised at how actually low like that number was as compared it. So if hybrid candidates were no longer allowed moving forward, do you think that would actually build up voter enthusiasm for a straight P candidate instead of a hybrid going on the Democratic Party candidate? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, absolutely. I There's think a lot of commingling there. There is, yeah, and I think it's it's on all sides, right? So um, we hear all the time, you know, Republicans are. Uh, I, yeah, I, 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 I would push back on that a little bit. I think you know we saw in the Chittenden County State's Attorney's race in Chittenden County, um, a lot of Republicans voting in the Democratic primary um, to vote for Sarah Fair George's opponent, right? And that's you know the potentially thousands of people, or at least hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, you know, we see that in gubernatorial races. Um, how many votes did, you know, Phil Scott get on the Democratic, you know, write-in votes did Phil Scott get in the Democratic primary? And I'm sure some of those are Democrats, but I think a lot of Republicans, if they see a contested race in the Democratic primary for their district, they do choose to pull the Democratic ballot. So we have an open primary system exactly because um, we want to give voters the choice every election and which primary they want to vote in. And um, that happens all the time. Um, and yes, yeah, certainly there are progressives who go vote in the Democratic primary, but you're allowed to do that in Vermont. And I think that's, you know, that's part of our political tradition and that's a very good thing. Um, would, would that shift if we ended fusion voting? Um, I think certainly there would be more people voting in the progressive primary as there would probably be more people voting in the Republican primary as well if they had to kind of, people had to choose in the same election. Um, but yeah, and we may very well have more um, three-way races on the state level, statewide level, and the House level. Um, I think that's certainly a possibility as well. Um, but yeah, I don't think that's the direction that Vermonters want us to go. I think we want to continue this tradition of allowing the political parties to work together um, on, on candidates when those candidates choose to. Josh, do you think that, so I, I think one of the key things you said um, that struck my ear was this idea of providing information to voters. And I don't know how we would do this, but do you think it would resolve some of the concern that folks who support eliminating the fusion voting, if there was a clear indication, for instance, in the legislative level of who are you going to caucus with, or do you have a party's endorsement? Because one of the, the, the things I've struggled with as we've 
considered these policies and considered you know making modifications of primaries over the years is I do really care about the integrity of what it says on that ballot and what it's communicating to voters. And with our system being as open as it is, where a county candidate can get a couple hundred votes and get a party's endorsement that they have no connection to. Like, do you, do you think there's any mechanism that your party or you would support to clarify for folks who really is affiliated with a party as, as opposed to just happening to get a small number of write-ins on, on an open line? Yeah, and I think a little bit of that is on the party. Like we we have that issue all the time, right? Like you know, it's no secret that um, our as a political party, we don't run candidates in most races, and that's intentional because we are um, the smallest of the major parties at this point, um, and we run races strategically um, where we feel like we we want to focus our energy, and that does create openings, like in both statewide and you know local races for candidates to do exactly what you're saying, who you know, have no affiliation with us to win those those write-in votes. And, um, you know, political parties can address that by running candidates in those races, even, you know, they can run and then withdraw. That's like one option that parties have, and that does happen all the time. Um, I believe the Republicans did that for most of their statewide races or many of their statewide races in the last election. Um, so a little bit of that is kind of, I think, could be on the, Repu the political party kind of to fight that and it's on them to kind of organize in those communities where they're worried about that. Um, you know, raising the, the right in threshold, I think I haven't thought about that fully, but that's something that might, you know, be worth looking into. Um, and again, I would also look at how many times has this actually happened? Um, and I know there are some, a few like high profile cases from this past election, um, but yeah, I would really want us to think about how, how, how frequently is that, an issue versus, you know, is it just one or two um, high profile instances that we're looking to change the entire kind of election system around? Representative Cooper. Uh, Mr. Chair, do you mind if we explore some hypotheticals with some historical context? <laughs> so just keep in mind, we have one more witness on this topic and we're going to take a look at that. So, if, so if, you, uh, if it's more something, if you have specific questions for Mr. Ronsky and the Progressive Party, a position on the bill, I'd say let's do that now. If you uh, want to throw some things on the table, we'll have time to have lots of committee discussion on this bill because we'll be working on it for a while. I abstain. Okay, totally. <laughs> Thank I really appreciate that. I don't want to stifle things. I just want to make sure we're asking the questions and discussing things at the right time. Um, great. Well, uh, any final questions for Mr. Ronsky? Great. Thank you so much for being here, Josh. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate the opportunity and good luck with your work. Uh, and our last witness on this topic uh, today is Paul Burns, who's the executive director at VPIRG. And Paul, thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the executive director of VPIRG, which is the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. I have had an opportunity many times uh, over the last 22 years uh, that I've been doing this work for VPIRG to address this committee. Um, as uh, committee members may know, VPIRG works on a broad range of issues from environment to democracy to healthcare to consumer protection, et cetera. And um, democracy, uh, kind of writ large, is one of the areas where I am chiefly involved as uh, uh, one of the advocates for the organization. And, and I do have a long uh, history here. So again, a pleasure to be here. Since it is my first time before the committee this year, I want to just provide a, a brief context. And uh, I want to make sure I get it right, so I'm going to read some of this. Um, I have been the executive director of VPIRG again for more than 22 years. VPIRG itself has operated as a 501c4 nonprofit in Vermont for 51 years. Since 1975, we have also had a 501c3 charitable nonprofit organization called Vermont Public Interest Research and Education Fund. And in the last several years, we became active in candidate elections for the first time, launching VPIRG Votes and VPIRG Votes Action Fund, a coordinated political committee and an independent expenditure committee, respectively. In my testimony today, I will be re representing VPIRG, the advocacy arm with which you are no doubt most familiar. 
Um, and and uh, I, I will note uh, for the record that VPIRC has long been involved in policy matters related to democratic reform, including campaign finance, uh, disclosure, lobbying, ranked choice voting, and various measures that have helped to make it easier for people in this state to vote. And today I'm uh, obviously focusing on the miscellaneous elections bill before you. And broadly, I would say that there are parts of the bill that VPIRC supports, parts that we oppose, uh, other parts that we don't have any formal position on. Um, and I know the time is brief, and so I'd be happy to uh, come back if that's um, helpful to you. But let me uh, just kind of run through some of the uh, uh, top lines. Uh, we support the provision in Section 8, uh, allowing for the voluntary filing and collection of candidates' demographic information. We believe this is important so Vermont can better track how we're doing as a state when it comes to having people in office who provide fair representation for the state as a whole. We believe that it's valuable to have various perspectives taking, uh, uh, helping to shape uh, the debate um, and decide the policy on uh, lots of different issues and priorities. Collecting these data will allow state the state, individuals, organizations, and candidates to assess where we are and what improvements might be made. The fact that the data collection is voluntary, I think should help to uh, resolve or remove any concerns about privacy. The PERG also supports uh, some of the provisions that uh, deal with writing candidates. Um, uh, specifically, I think serious writing candidates would not, should not be dissuaded by the requirement to file with appropriate state or local officials in the days leading up to an election. Such a requirement eases the burden on local election officials. Uh, Lord knows that would be a good thing. And, um, and I think where less serious writing candidates, uh, this would be the case where less serious writing candidates have almost no chance of winning. Um, there are other aspects of the write-in uh, policy, which um, we are, uh, are not taking a kind of a formal position on today. I'd be happy to kind of think about it and, and, um, uh, and provide more information later if that's helpful. But uh, there are two significant provisions of the bill, however, that VPIRG opposes. The first is Section 6 relating to the cross nominations. It's our position that voters benefit from the opportunity to see all candidate uh, party endorsements uh, that a candidate receives. Cross nominations may tell us something useful and important about the candidate and their beliefs. Conversely, we see no value in denying voters a chance to see that a candidate has, has received the nomination of multiple parties. We don't believe that this is a problem that needs to be fixed. And indeed, it was uh, mentioned there are opportunities even to strengthen fusion voting. I come from New York State uh, originally, and I will just uh, uh, say that my father was a local elected official for 22 years, a county legislator there. His districts were about the size of yours with 4,000 plus um, uh, constituents. Um, he first ran for office as a Democrat, but was cross endorsed by the conservative party. And he had a lot of friends in our small town who assured him they would never have voted for him on the Democratic line. But because they could vote for him on a separate line as a conservative, um, he he ultimately won that election. He served as primarily as a Democrat for 11 years and then switched to a Republican. So my you know, background is very uh, bi or tripartisan in that respect, I guess, uh, from the family history. Um, but I'm not really proposing that you move that direction on fusion voting here, uh, but that's what New York has, is your name is literally listed multiple times for each political party where you have an endorsement. And that does give, I think, voters an option that they otherwise do not have, gives them that freedom. I mean, we can criticize, but voters, some voters feel very strong. I'm never going to pull the lever under this political party, but I would under another. So it kind of frees them up to vote for a candidate um, if they receive multiple party endorsements. And it gives those smaller, tend to be smaller political parties, a little bit more um, uh, credibility and power in an election process as well by by getting involved in a race like that can tip the balance and has in states like New York or Connecticut and others. Um, moving then to the uh, question of campaign finance um, in this bill, this is the provision that would allow candidates to give unlimited contributions to political parties. We have been very active on campaign finance issues for decades. Our belief is that Elections and races are not benefited by allowing for unlimited contributions from any source. In fact, we think the opposite is true. Unlimited contributions or expenditures from very wealthy individuals, candidates, um, parties, or corporations 
tend to have a corrupting influence over the process. I was at the U.S. Supreme Court in February of 2006 when the Vermont case on campaign finance reform was heard before the U.S. Supreme Court. It was kind of a proud moment. VPER had played a role in passing that law to begin with in 1997 here. And you may recall that law set strict limits on campaign contributions, $200 to state rep candidates, $300 for Senate candidates, and $400 for statewide candidates quaint, I guess, uh, today, but th those were the limits that went to the Supreme Court. And that, that law also passed with an absolute limit on what candidates could spend in their races. That was intentionally, you could say, constitutionally provocative because of the Buckley v. Vallejo decision that had been they had come down in 1976, essentially saying money equals speech and you can't limit what candidates spend in their races. However, I would point out that the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, just below the U.S. Supreme Court, upheld Vermont's provisions on both contributions and on that expenditure limit. And had the U.S. Supreme Court makeup been a little bit different, for instance, had the 2000 election been decided a little bit differently in the state of Florida, we maybe wouldn't have lost that on a six to three Supreme Court uh, decision and perhaps would have prevailed there. Paul, oh, I really am, I hesitate to interrupt your testimony. But I, I just want to ask you a question on this specific thing. And I, I, I held off from asking Mr. Ronsky when he characterized uh, the, this provision in a similar way. I supported putting this suggestion into this bill because I believe that in a post-Citizens United world, the most transparent way that we keep track of who's spending money on what is to have candidates raise money, report who's getting those contributions, and then if they want to work with their party to help get themselves elected, hire staff, et cetera, they should be able to freely do that as long as it's totally transparent how they're spending. That's why I supported this increase just from candidates to the, their parties so that there is transparency because the reality in a post Citizens United world is there are lots of ways that you can get the money there but they're the least transparent ways. So I'm wondering if you could just yep. like respond to that version of the framing of why that provisions in the bill. The Supreme Court has made it probably difficult to achieve a lot of the aims that, that I'm guessing we may share, or the values that we would like to see in elections. I grant that that is absolutely the case. So the question has often come down to, well, maybe is transparency the way to go and just have greater transparency and no limits um, on contributions and expenditures and we, have maintained the belief that that is not the way to go to move away from reasonable limits on contributions. And you can look at reasons why. Why do people give to candidates? So I think most people give so that they can help that candidate get elected to office, not necessarily so that that candidate can turn around and use that money for some other purpose, even backing up the political party uh, that that candidate happens to belong to. So you can ask, you know, is, is that the right way to allow for that kind of money to flow through the system? We are, in a sense, allowing uh, uh, our laws to be circumvented uh, by if we were to allow candidates to make unlimited contributions. I, I think the, also the idea of unlimited is also giving me and perhaps others pause here. Um, and is that really necessary? I mean, how many candidates can we imagine who are going to make a contribution of a million dollars to a political party here? And yet one could um, with this kind of thing, perhaps a retiring U.S. senator might decide uh, that uh, he or she wanted to make that kind of a contribution to a party. And I don't I don't think that would be fair. I mean, I don't think that really is what was intended by the people who made those contributions to that candidate. And I don't think that's really fair for our election system here, that one party could be advantaged in that massive way by the decision of one individual who happened to use the wealth that they accumulated by uh, receiving these contributions. So that scenario that you talked about is, is current law today for senators, members of Congress that are elected from Vermont? They, they can make those contributions unlimited. And the proposal we have before us is to say statewide candidates for governor, secretary of state, et cetera, could also do that. Yeah. Um, would VPIRG feel more inclined to, to support or be neutral if we came up with some reasonable threshold? Because $10,000 in the modern era is just, it's absurdly small. It asks statewide candidates to get PACs to contribute on their behalf. And that is the least transparent way 
to run an election. And ten thousand dollars for a statewide race uh, from their campaign to a party doesn't allow for hardly any co collaboration. I mean, it wouldn't pay one fraction of one staff person's salary, for instance. So that, that's just the kind of thing I'm wrestling with with this bill: is how do we, you know, have some reasonable way for a statewide candidate to coordinate with the party without having an end run around our transparency system. Yeah, and to be clear, we don't support the idea that the federal candidates can spend their money that way. <laughs> clear, but I understand. There's a, um, and yeah, um, so, I mean, unlimited is particularly problematic. If we're talking about something else, then yes, you know, uh, we can have some conversation about that. We have, uh, uh, so probably enough said there, but I'd be happy to revisit. We have commented on these laws. We commented on 10,000. We commented on all the others that are in place now. These are these are aspects of Vermont law that we have been rather involved in over the years. So would be happy to engage in further conversation. There. Representative, thank you. Um, in any case, if you have never been to the U.S. Supreme Court, I encourage you to go. Uh, it is democracy in action. And even if you don't win the case, it is an awesome thing to see and observe. Um, and to be there as Vermont's campaign finance law was debated in front of the Supreme Court was a really special um, experience. It happened that Anna Nicole Smith was there on the same day having her case argued, and um, that's another story. Um, so um, those are the um, chief provisions that uh, in this bill, there are others that we, we really don't have an organizational position on. I know they're of uh, keen interest to this committee and you've received some other testimony and consideration there. They're just not things that VPIRG itself has weighed in on at this point. I would say that in terms of other ways of looking at these elections and how they might move forward, I encourage the committee to um, be open to ideas like banning corporate contributions, direct corporate contributions to candidates. This is something that we have been supporting for years. The Senate has passed that legislation a few times. We hope that it will be taken up again this year. As part of that bill, they've also looked at ways to improve our public financing system, which is on the books today, but is, it is not really um, an effective or, or usable system for those who are serious candidates for, you know, if they intend to get elected. Why do we keep a law on the books that is like that? I mean, it maybe make us feel good that we've got public financing, but if it's not real, um, I don't think that's, um, that's a good thing. And so we encourage you to consider ways to change that. There are ideas like democracy dollars being, that has been used in a couple of elections in Seattle that we are particularly supportive of, and that was listed specifically in previous legislation that was passed by the Senate. Um, I think you know we support ranked choice voting. Um, we're very active in the Burlington um, Town Meeting Day, which will there be a proposal to expand ranked choice voting there. It'll also be used in all city district city council races in Burlington um, and was used effectively in the December 6th special election for a city council race in Burlington. Went really well. Would love to come back and talk more about that um, at some point. Uh, ranked choice voting has also been paired with uh, something uh, similar to what Mr. Ronsky uh, spoke of earlier, which is a kind of a winnowing of the field in the primary. And uh, there's something called final four or final five um, policies that have, are in place in other places. So, for instance, some of you may have watched Alaska. The special election for the congressional seat in Alaska got a lot of attention because both Sarah Palin and Santa Claus were running in that race. And uh, it was ultimately won by a Democrat. But the way they run the, the primary there is that you can be of any political party or I believe independent candidates as well. And the top four move on to the general election. Whatever party, it could be four Republicans, four Democrats, whatever mix, uh, et cetera. And, and then that general election is decided on a ranked choice voting ballot. And so you choose those candidates, and you can rank them one to four, or choose not to if that's your preference. Um, but that's the way the, the Alaska special election and the general election were held. Um, and that is uh, how Senator Murkowski was also reelected. Uh, a, a relatively moderate Republican, and there was concern that there was no way she's going to win a Republican primary in Alaska anymore unless it had an open process like this. And that is one of the reasons why Alaska moved forward, a cons fairly red state uh, in terms of national politics, and adopted ranked choice voting to allow for a more moderate candidate, uh, giving that more moderate candidate the possibility of moving forward in the election. So uh, I just encourage you to think about that. There are other ways of going forward. And um, we support, as a kind of a first step in this field, simply using ranked choice voting for the next presidential primary here, uh, which would be in obviously next year in 2024. Uh, half dozen or so states are already using ranked choice voting in the presidential primary. And there, the key incentive, I think, is that 
By the time the primary takes place in Vermont, we now have uh, mail-in voting that many people use. But if you vote early, a good chance, well, it's not uncommon for the candidate you, su you supported it when you sent your ballot in is no longer in the race by the time our primary takes place. And thousands of Vermonters have been disenfranchised or their votes have been wasted when a candidate has dropped out before the primary even takes place here in, in case of the presidential. And I think that's one of the most important reasons to consider ranked choice in that situation. I know that's not what you're considering as part of this. So uh, I will just say uh, while we're on it that um, I know Senator Hardy's uh, our counterpart uh, is taking a lot of testimony on ranked choice voting. I imagine that we'll have a charter change bill from Burlington if that measure to expand the RCV there passes. So um, that is a topic that uh, I would encourage the committee to start doing your <laughs> your reading on because there's a, a lot to it. And uh, I know that Deeper is a big advocate for it. Um, I'm sure we will be talking about RCV later in the session. Look forward to it. Thank you. And thanks. So thanks very much for the opportunity to provide testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions. If there are any questions for Paul. Really? I was the only one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, in an ideal world, uh, how soon would we adopt ranked choice voting outright? Um, I think there are probably steps that we would take as a state. So again, I think giving voters statewide the opportunity to try out ranked choice voting on a ballot where it's the only thing on the ballot for the presidential primary has real merit. There's no confusion there for the voters that there's multiple offices, some with ranked choice, some without. So I think getting a, a chance to try that out in a, in a pri presidential primary where, again, a number of states have done it. We're not inventing the wheel here. We can look to how they have done it and participate in broad public education around it uh, in that instance as well. I think from there, we would probably look at the federal races here, U.S. Congress and U.S. Senate. There are no issues about constitutionality for those offices. They exist now. Maine, for instance, has used it. Alaska, as I mentioned, and other states are looking at that as well. Um, and so I think that could happen. You, you could look at that in 2026 or something like that. But, uh, but then I think you move forward. There are other questions, I will say, with respect to statewide offices. Uh, I think it may, would make a lot of sense for a uh, governor and lieutenant governor here where we have, with all due respect, a very undemocratic process. If a candidate running for governor receives less than, fin uh, less than 50 percent, it goes to all of you to decide on a secret ballot who our governor is. Um, right. That's that's unusual um, and not very democratic, uh, to be uh, perfectly honest. And um, the last time that happened in a gubernatorial race, there were uh, nearly 70 uh, uh, legislators who voted for the second place finisher um, in that case. And again, uh, well, I'll just say, I don't think that's the best process. I would love to see this, but there are constitutional questions there that would need to be addressed um, uh, or figured out. We think it is it would be constitutional. Others take a different opinion about that because of the, the way that our specific constitutional language says it goes to the legislature if so, nobody gets 50 percent. Overall, you endorse an incremental approach. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. And, it, and, and that's exactly kind of the path that we're on with Burlington, the largest city, uh, using it, implementing it, and moving to expand it, potentially for presidential primaries, and then federal, and then we'll see. I think we will definitely be having you back, Mr. Burns. So thank you very much for bringing the perspective to our bill. Um, we're going to have Representative Bloomley in it in just a bit, so I want to give the committee 10 minutes. So we'll go off live and be back at 3.33. <laughs> <laughs> 233, not 333. All right, welcome back to the second half of our Valentine's Day uh, testimony here in the House Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee. Uh, I want to welcome Representative Bloomley, and um, you're going to talk to us a little bit about, I'm forgetting the bill number, H226, which is uh, an act relating to candidate information to be provided by the Secretary of State, which uh, we I got out a little bit ahead of you with some of our committee bill language, but yeah. here you are. <laughs> That's all right. It's always nice when somebody likes an idea enough to put it into something else. Um, <clears throat> so for the record, Tiff Bloomley, from uh, representative from Burlington. Um, so some of you may know that in a past life between 1998 and 2015, I ran an organization called Vermont Works for Women, which was focused specifically on women, increasing women's economic opportunity um, and their ability to support themselves um, and their families. 
during that time, I came to this body many, many times, never imagining I would actually sit in this body. Um, and I was asked to testify um, on our programs and the need for them. And to do that, I needed state employment and state-sponsored training data broken out by gender. Year after year, it was never available. And so in 2015, in frustration, I founded another uh, nonprofit initiative called Change the Story, which focused on developing that data. And because changing the story really hinges upon telling the story. <clears throat> the value of demographic data enables us to know more about those who are being served by the programs that we fund, um, and who we may not be reaching. And it helps flesh out a uh, picture of where we are and can indicate where we might want to, to um, dedicate energy moving forward. Study after study after study <clears throat> has demonstrated the benefits of diversity to teams of scientists, to um, workplaces, um, to bodies like this. And <clears throat> this body and the administration have been really clear about our need to attract and support a more di a diverse workforce um, and encourage people to come and live here. And to do that, we really have to work to make Vermont a place where equity matters. And one of the measures by which we can measure our progress against <clears throat> that goal is how well Vermont's full complement of perspectives and experiences are engaged in shaping local um, <clears throat> and state policies and problems. Knowing the current representation of women, people of color, young people serving in elective office at every level of government enables us to more, know more about whose voices and experience we might be missing. It helps organizations who work with marginalized communities better understand the work that must be done to achieve equality of representation. And accurate data about representation and the length of terms uh, can inform and potentially encourage more people to run for office. <clears throat> There's no single publicly available repository of data on the name, age, gender, race, or term expiration of locally um, <clears throat> elected officials in Vermont. This demographic data is also not collected for legislative or statewide officials. The bill that I introduced seeks to remedy that situation by collecting this data from local candidates and requiring municipal clerks to pass it on to the Secretary of State's office when filing local and statewide election results the, for the victors, and collecting this data from legislative and statewide candidates when they file for candidacy <clears throat> with the Secretary of State's office. So only information on individuals elected, <clears throat> not all candidates would be forwarded to the Secretary of State. Um, which reduces its burden on the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of State's office would make the data available to the public on its website. So the bill that I offer for your <clears throat> consideration is really um, <clears throat> largely embedded into in your current committee bill. Um, the only such <laughs> changes between the bills are um, the following, or four things. My own inclusion of school board members, <clears throat> um, I, I think that conversations with um, Ledge Council and others have convinced me that that is a hard nut to crack because there isn't a direct pipeline of that information to the Secretary of State's office. <clears throat> the use of the word municipality instead of town and county, I don't care. What is what you will know this committee, you know, what is the better term to use, uh, including the end date of a particular office's term because <clears throat> there are you know, in many city councils, um, staggered terms, so it's helpful for people to know well, when is this person's term um, ending? And so <clears throat> when might they be up for re-election? And then your bill's <clears throat> very explicit acknowledgement that candidates are not required to fill out their own demographic information. They will not be penalized for it. Um, the <clears throat> information, I mean, the, the nothing, um, <clears throat> whatever they fill out will be accepted by the secretary of, uh, by the, the local official and the secretary of state as long as the signatures um, required have been collected. So, 
So, uh, and I, I support com completely the acknowledgement that, um, ag acknowledging in the terms that you have in your committee bill, this, um, uh, <clears throat> I've lost my words today, I'm sorry. <laughs> there have been too many, I've, <laughs> I've heard too much testimony today. Too many numbers. <laughs> too many numbers, <laughs> exactly. Um, <clears throat> But I, I think it's really important to leave this as a voluntary thing, um, I, because I think that <clears throat> some people will choose to fill it out, some people will not. Um, um, and nobody should be penalized for not filling it out. Um, but it will, if the provision in your bill, <clears throat> which um, adopts provisions in my bill were passed, then we would have a single authoritative repository of information by which we could then measure progress in terms of the diversity <clears throat> um, of uh, uh, the diverse representation um, of our <laughs> cities and state. I apologize. You know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Representative. <clears throat> And uh, I want to appreciate and acknowledge that you, you are, are on our hallowed uh, and hardworking appropriations committee. So I really appreciate your time, especially. <laughs> um, questions for Representative Bloomley. I think you did a great job of laying out why I was uh, happy to include this well. idea. And I, I guess my question is, um, do you feel like we um, have captured the spirit of what you were hoping to do with 226 in the miscellaneous bill. I know that we, mm. when, and I was talking to legislative council um, and the elections division, there are some concerns about the, the logistical <clears throat> things we mentioned around school board members. Yeah. Um, so that's, you're sort of willing to sacrifice <clears throat> that until we yes. can figure out an easier way to yeah. gather that information. I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I have no problems with the bill submitted. I just, I, would, I think it would be very helpful to include the end date of a particular office's term um, in, in um, that um, database. But that's, everything else I think is great. And I'd be, I'd be grateful if um, <clears throat> you could help satisfy this lifelong quest of mine for <laughs> there to be a place where one could go for this kind of data. <clears throat> Any questions for Representative Bloomley? No. All righty. Thank you so much. For well, coming. sorry that I tripped over my words. <clears throat> anyway, very, very nice to see you all. And <clears throat> thanks very much for the work you're doing. <laughs> all right.